Information about the world of running, inspiration to fuel passion and excellence, and ideas for making connections and finding community. You're listening to A to Z Running. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 46th episode of the A to Z Running Podcast. I'm Andy. With Zach. And here's what you need to do right now. Pause the episode and go to a to z running.com. That is A to Z, all letters, all words, running.com. And in the top corner or the top menu, click follow and then subscribe to our website because it's free and you get all of the great stuff that we're cooking and brewing right now. Advanced notice on great things that are coming at you soon. And after you've done that, Go to your favorite social media stuff, which I know nothing about. I'm sure Andy can tell you more about that. <laughs> and follow us or comment on the post. Get connected and engaged with the conversation because that's really the work that we're trying to do. And mm-hmm. plus, if you share something interesting or a question that we feel like we could potentially address, we might just talk about it right now. So the handle is at A to Z running. And Melanie from Texas, she got a hold of us actually through email and she asked us, what a cure is for shin splints. So this is definitely a question that every runner wonders at some point in time. And, you know, we talk about like high schoolers that just basically have perpetual shin splints nonstop. And any new runner is probably feeling shin splints at some point. And any one of us who takes a break for a decent period of time likely is going to be getting. So shin splints is a common question. And the answer to that in, in most instances is simply to spend a lot more time stretching and mobilizing our ankles and calves. Even though the shin is what's hurting, it's not a shin muscle issue. It's generally immobility or inflexibility in your calves. So work on those feet, work on those ankles, work on those calves, and you're over time going to be able to defeat shin splints. And by the way, shin splints should not be a recurring problem when you're in the midst of training either. So address it as early and often as you can, but if it's continuing and ongoing, then you got to go see somebody because there's also a high potential for things like stress reactions in Mm -hmm. those bones. Yeah, and I think also to the proper footwear. I think it's been said time and time again, but you're hearing it here again. Your proper footwear is going to help protect your feet and ankles and protect your shins because wherever you're going to be falling biomechanically on your foot is going to affect how your shins feel. So thanks for the question, Melanie from Texas. And apparently handle is a word that matters with social media because Andy corrected me. So if you're going on social media, I guess you have to look for our handle. <laughs> to get a handle on it? So you can hold on to us. Yes. That, that, that's what oh, it that's, is, right? That's funny. Yes. At A to Z running. So you're not following us. You're holding on to us oh my on goodness, social media. That's so awkward. <laughs> it's not awkward, Andy. It's exactly what the word means. So we have a new pla- pair of sunglasses you probably have seen on social media, uh, knockarounds. And I've never really been obsessed with sunglasses, but they sent us some. And now I'm kind of obsessed because they're like a great price point. And so that means you could have more than one pair. And I've always been scared of having sunglasses because of the cost because I'm I'm notorious for losing my sunglasses. Andy has lost every pair of sunglasses no. she's ever possessed, <laughs> including some of mine oh, that no. she only possessed briefly but it's still calling lost. Me out. It's true. And I have always been obsessed with sunglasses, which means I always have many pair of them. Far more That's than Andy true. thinks I need. How many macarons do you have? More than I'm willing to say on this episode. <laughs> and that's a testament to two things. One, because the price point is low, you can do that. And two, they're awesome. They're wonderful. So I started thinking to myself, I need to have every pair of knockarounds. Oh, goodness. And they're customizable. So like that's infinite, right? Like, exactly. Infinite, but almost. It will continue. And one more thing. We do have a giveaway going on on Instagram. If you're listening here in August, I know there's different time frames, but you can always be looking for giveaways from us in, in different forms. So make sure you hop on over to Instagram at A to Z running. And it's just a way for us to help grow, help us expand our reach. So not only are you going to be helping A to Z running podcast, but also you can win stuff so it's a win-win if you have someone that you think that might like our podcast please let them know so you may have noticed that we're a little bit energetic right now and that's for two reasons one because crazy exciting things have been happening in running lately and we're going to get to that in just a moment Crazy. we also had a great conversation with nate van holten better known as q 
and talked with him about historical moments and mm-hmm. figures in track and field and running. And I tell you what, I just get so fired up when pumped I do up. that. I'm so pumped. And it was just, it was reminiscent because it, it, Q was my coach in college. And so I have had conversations like this with Q many, many times. And to sit down with him across the table again and just have that chat after so many years of not being able to do that regularly, it just brought me way back. And he is the guru of the running history. Guru. So we'll talk more on that. But first, let's talk about the world of running. Okay, so the first and most important thing to mention from running news lately is a new world record men's 5,000 meters on the track. Yes, 16-year-old wow. world record was broken. 16 years old. So we've talked about Kennedy Bekele on the podcast a number a of legend. times. Because he has been known as the king of distance running. And, you know, goes from all the way back in the early 2000s when he started world dominance to even as recent as the 2019 Berlin Marathon when he ran two seconds slower than Kipchoge's amazing world record. So he's a king of distance running. Mm -hmm. And his 5,000 meter world record just fell by two seconds to Joshua Cheptege from Uganda in a time of 1235 in the 5,000 meters. What? So this is the moment where everyone's jaws should be low. Yes. As low as they can go. How low can they go <laughs> all the way to the floor? So your jaws dropping because that means he just ran about 402 mile pace oh, for 5,000 meters. And get this. He negative split every K. Every 1,000 meters was faster than the previous one. Mm-hmm. At breakneck speed <laughs> and zach uh, we were watching it uh, it's it's incredible to watch we're going to link to that in our show notes a to z running.com slash episode 46 but he did not have pacers for very long it was not <laughs> significant amount it. of time so uh, do you oh, remember man. what it was it was like pacers were gone by 2500 meters okay so halfway and then halfway. He, in the second half which is the worst half in right. distance running anything and he had to do it solo. And he mm-hmm. didn't just do it solo, but he just continued a gradual acceleration mm-hmm. throughout. I am shocked. And this almost didn't happen because the country of Uganda was not going to allow him to compete. That's right. He was fighting with them for weeks, the story goes, to try to get them to let him travel. They, As many of us do, we have travel bans. And they weren't going to let him even go to the race. Mm -hmm. And I bet they're thinking to themselves, yeah, it was probably a good reason he did. (laughs) And on a side note, not only did he break the world record, but another Ugandan athlete, a female, broke the Ugandan 1,000 meter record. Yes. So it's a good thing they let their athletes travel because they're good. So that was that was the headliner, Joshua Cheptege running 12:35 in the 5K, two seconds off Kenanisa Bekele's previous world record, and that should uh, it should be mentioned that's four now total humans ever to run under 12:40, and all four of them are like the greatest of their time mm-hmm. athletes, and so it's it's great to just see where's where's Joshua Cheptege going to continue going. He won the 10,000 meters in the World Championships last year. He broke the 10,000 world record on the roads shortly after that. Now, 5K track record. I'm just so excited to watch this guy. He's about 23 years old. He's got a career ahead of him still. I am fired up. And there's more. So, uh, Jacob Ingebrigtsen, you've heard us talk mm-hmm. about him a lot from Norway. And we, we're really excited to talk about him largely because of the entire story. So, if you haven't heard any of our previous stuff or you just want to Google him and find out, one of the things is there's three of them, the Ingebrigtsen brothers, and they're all world class athletes currently. Each one ran yeah. in the Monaco Diamond League races. Two of them, Jacob and his brother Philip, ran in the 1500 and then Henrik their brother ran in the 5k so these guys are crazy well Jacob just broke another record another one 1500 he went 328 now reflect on this a moment they do the conversion here because it's just short of a mile if he continued that pace for a full mile he'd basically have just run about 345 Mm. in the full mile the world record in the miles only two seconds faster than that so this is crazy right and not only was it a national record for norway it was also an area record a european record beating mo farah's european record the king 
And Mo Farah is another great one, yeah. So these are exciting things. Timothy Chariot actually won the race, so Jacob was second in the race in that kind of a time, uh, just barely. He was like two-tenths behind Timothy. And it's one of the craziest stories there, too, because Timothy Chariot's pacer botched the race. Yeah. He went out in 52 seconds for the first 400, which is like a 144-800 pace. That's world-class 800 runners. Wow. And clearly realized his mistake when he came through 400. They slowed way down. But, man, that's not a fun way to have to do it. But the guy still won the race. The, yeah. the guy hanging off the pacer was Timothy Chariot. So that's really something. Yeah, and I think that just even is more of a testament to Jacob's uh, mastery of the sport so early on. Because how old is he again, Zach? He is 19 He's 19 years, years old, and he didn't actually go with the pacer. He knew he could feel that it was too fast. Yeah. And so he hung back and then ended up closing the gap that was between them. But I thought that was a, a lot of maturity for a yeah. young athlete. Yeah, and he would have won that race if it was anyone except Timothy Chariot up there because that guy is just hard to beat in the 1500. So uh, just a quick run through then on a couple of more things because that of course the meet didn't end there. We had Faith Kipiegan running a new African record in the thousand meters, so 229, which is under eight under two minute 800 meter pace for 1k. Wow. So that's something you know that's really fast for women. Uh, that's really fast for men. What am I saying? So she does that and just barely misses the world record by under two tenths of a second, which is crazy. And that's a, that world record's about 24 years old, mm -hmm. 20, 22, 24 years old. So that's, that's really incredible. She was right there. And then in the same race, Laura Muir ran a new British record 1k over her teammate and training partner, Gemma Riki, who just recently beat her. <laughs> so they flip-flopped, um, which is just really something. And they're both running crazy That's amazing. fast. And we talked about training partners last yes, week and what they we can did. do for you. So we had uh, Leah Fallon and Emily Oren about training partners. And it just goes to show you with Laura Muir and Gemma Riki, how they've been able to work together for their potential and greatness too. Yeah, it's best. It's definitely elevating the game for, for both of them. And in the women's 5K, Helen O'Beary just barely edged out Shelby Houlihan's net world leading time for the year. So you remember Shelby ran 1423 solo, basically, with her teammates in, in a mm -hmm. time trial. And Helen O'Beary of Kenya just ran 1422. So, it, you know, just really is a testament to how crazy Shelby's performance was because mm -hmm. Helen's at like a world-class meet and Shelby just ran with her teammates. Yeah. That's, that's really, I would love to see the two of them race. That's me, me dreaming here for a moment. So great things all around and there's more, there's always more, but you know what? Uh, we probably need to keep moving along. So we have to talk about what happened on U.S. soil at the Nashville Music City Distance Carnival. On Running showed up and we had told you last week, we promised you last week, that we were going to keep you updated on this team and it's really exciting stuff, you guys. Dathan Ritzenhine is the coach. He did a couple interviews too, so that was fun to see him on air. Uh, but we want to talk about uh, some of the athlete performances. Leah Fallon, she tied her PR in 411. And this is like after a few years of not running a 1500. That's really something. Yes. <laughs> Bummer that it was a, you know, tied her PR. She was right there to get a PR. But, but really great showing. Emily Oren ran a PR of 414, which is super impressive. So there's your training partners right there. Training Leah partners. Emily. They were on our episode last week. So make sure you check that out. They're a really inspiring um, team and really inspiring as training partners too. Alicia Monson, she ran a PR of 412. So she's right there too. Oliver Hoare, he went, ran 334 for a Tennessee soil record. This is his first race as a pro runner. Okay. And then Joe Klecker, teammate, also ran PR of 337. So man, Dathan, that's a, Dathan. Quite, a, quite a team you've assembled there. This is yeah. really exciting. So we're looking forward to sharing more about On Running With You as their race is coming up next week in L.A. So while there is so much more to talk about, we've run out of time. We got to keep moving along, but we'll just add more to the conversation again next week. This week on the podcast, we have Nate Q. Van Holten, and he is known as Coach Q to Zach on a personal level, but also just as far as being a coach of an elite running club called Q Elite. 
He is the coach of Race Walker, Cody Risch, who is on this podcast, John Cody Risch. He is a U.S. race walker who has Olympic potential. He's coached multiple athletes to the Olympic trials and the U.S. Junior Championships. And Zach, he coached you to be the national champion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Several others as well. Several He's others. many individual national champions at the NAIA collegiate level mm-hmm. and is currently an assistant coach at Grand Valley State. He's very involved in the running community. And his wife, Jane, is actually raising money for World Vision. So we're going to link to that if you would like to support too. So Andy had this great idea of wanting to really dig into some of the big moments and big figures in running history. And especially just talking about what it is that made those moments or those people that, that big, that exciting, that notable. And of course, as soon as we started thinking about that conversation, Q came up in our minds because there's never been a time, a period of time that I've not known Q as the source of knowledge on running and track and field history. So of course then, who best to have the conversation with but Q. So let's get to it. All right. Welcome, finally, I want to say finally, to the show, Nate Van Holten, better known as Q. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. We've talked about you a lot on this podcast, by the way. Um, so we're really Mostly happy. Mostly to- positive, too, in fact. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Um, but we just gave, like, a description about you. But we want to mention something interesting. You have a collection. Tell us about it. Uh, I love track and field. I love all aspects of track and field. So I, I honestly just try to collect anything track and field that I can in general. Obviously, I love older stuff, too, because there's just a lot of history attached to it. So uh, Track and Field News came out in 1948. I have... All but one issue. I don't have the first issue, which I'm still looking So for. if you're listening and you have that, you got to give it to them. It, just, it doesn't matter what it is, where it is, you got to give it to them. Uh, but just a lot of cool stuff. I have actually a couple uh, javelins. I have a javelin that was pre-grip. So it's pretty, and actually it's carved on the ends to actually make a javelin. And I have a javelin from like the 1928 Olympics. It's all wooden and stuff. So some pretty cool, just stuff like that that I think is cool. So at some point or another, someone's going to come knocking on your door saying, hey, um, can you be the person who gives us all the stuff for our track and field museum? Because you have all the stuff for any track and field museum. (laughs) So while we could talk about a lot of things right now, um, we do want to get into your expertise specifically. And so as I was an athlete under UQ, one of the things that stood out almost immediately was how much more you knew about the sport than I thought anyone did. You know, it's it, running is like that sport that, you know, people just do it. They don't really, you know, like study the stats and they don't, that, that was my impression. And then I met you and I found out that it was possible to be passionate about the sport in its entirety. And that was really exciting for me. And so I've enjoyed now over all of these years being able to learn from you as I talk with you about the sport and just get excited about things within and around the sport of running and track and field. And so what we want to do today is we want to really tap into just what's gone on in track and field and running history and why it's interesting and some of those those big moments throughout the sport. So Q, you want to lead us off? Sure. Um, I mean, I guess there's a ton of things to talk about. There's so many out there, really. And so I'll just kind of come up with some that stick out. Uh, my, my first one, I guess, that I, I just put on my list was Dina Castor, 2004 Olympics. And she gets the bronze medal. Um, and the thing, that, honestly, that I like most about it, one, it set a huge standard for American women. Dina was, you know, on top of the world then doing things, setting all sorts of American records and doing everything. And she was blazing the forefront of some of the massive times that we've seen today from our American women. Uh, but the, I think the thing that I like most about the story, you know, the marathon is just a crazy, a long, tiring event. And, you know, when packs start to separate, you have no idea technically where you're at. You don't know if the five people that left you at mile six are they even still in the race? You actually don't know. And so um, a lot of major marathons or major Olympic marathons, you kind of enter the stadium and we'll do a lap on the track as like a final lap, which I always think is cool too, because they get a chance to be on the track. And uh, so Dina was doing her in a sense, final lap to finish the marathon. And someone in the crowd was like, you're third. That's so awesome. And she didn't know she was in third. And she just instantly starts to cry like, I have a medal. I'm going to get an Olympic medal. And I can't imagine. I mean, the emotions you're already feeling at the end of a marathon, you're already tired. You're just exhilarated. It'll be over. Um, But oh my gosh, everything I've worked for is actually paying off. And and to not even know, like you're surprised yourself. Everyone knew before you knew. And uh, 
to me, that's like a huge moment, I think, especially in, for just, like I said, women in our sport and American women of kind of the trajectory that set us on all around. So I, I think that's a super cool one. You know, that's, that is really something, um, both in the moment and in, you know, that grander kind of vision of what was happening for American distance running at that time. And I think one of the things I really, really appreciate about Dina Castor too, um, is both how long she's invested herself in the sport. You know, a lot of people kind of like they hit moments of glory and they kind of just drift away. Um, that tends to happen and probably for good reason, you know, how can you get a high like that again? And, and so that makes sense, but she, she never did that. And she stayed dialed in with, supporting other runners in the sport and still to this day. For sure. Um, and that's just, I've, you know, I've really appreciated because it's, it's always seemed like to me as I hear her talk and as I see the, the different things and materials around her that, um, you know, she really cares about the sport and she cares about growing it and growing passion for it in other people. And that's really been cool. So Andy, share one that you've got. So speaking of the marathon and women's marathon, I think that we should talk about Catherine Switzer. She was the woman you probably have seen the photo. If you've been looking in any kind of track and field history at all, you're going to see this photo. She was like physically almost pulled off the course. And she was the first person, the first woman to run the Boston Marathon. And at the end, she even had adversity. People were yelling like, real women don't run. And she was banned from athletic competition. So as far as women's running goes, she's a champion. I mean, without her, I wouldn't have gotten to compete at the Olympic trials marathon, most likely at this point. It's so crazy, too, just to think like obviously women's rights have grown throughout the years. But one, I mean, just even how late that was. And to think that like who cares if a woman runs a race? Like why would they if you're a race director, you charge a fee to get in and that's how you make your money. So you want as many people as you can. So why would you have ever limited yourself in the first place? Like, why did that? Why did it matter? And yeah, to see people physically trying to pull her off as if she was taking something from them, like this men's club, makes no sense. But thank goodness she did it. And, and the guys that protected her, too, during the race, that's kind of a really cool part of the story, too. Oh, yeah. OK, so she started a club and she started to do events, even though she was banned. And eventually she did get sponsored. So as far as perseverance goes and someone to look up for just for the sake of, you know, what it means to be someone who runs the race with endurance and perseverance. She's someone that I definitely look up to for that because it wasn't just like she ran that race and everything was amazing. She had to fight for years in order to be back on the scene. Yeah, for sure. There's something about the conversation of, um, you know, to, to have to fight the battle on multiple fronts. You know, we see that in historically in a lot of different ways and these kinds of things. And, you know, I, I always think about Jesse Owens with something like that. And, um, you know, it's not just the race you're running, but it's the battle you're fighting in life and other areas at the same moment. And that, that's, you know, that seems tough. Like, I I don't, I don't know how well I could hold up like mental fortitude, um, when I can't, I can't just focus on running the race. I have to be aware of these other things and such too. So for our listeners who don't know who Jesse Owens is, Zach, you want to tell us about him? Okay. Well, I wasn't going to immediately say this because I have another marathon or two, but um, Jesse Owens is definitely one we've got to mention when we're talking about historical track and field things. So I think the thing that always stands out to me, if you've seen the movie, um, what was the movie called? Race. Race. So if you've seen the movie, the, the entire experience of, first of all, the Olympics held in Nazi Germany at the time um, and a black man going as one of the most accomplished athletes, you know, most promising athletes in the field. And so, you know, he has people literally rooting against him in these races. And even, and I think this is really hits me the hardest with it. Even when he gets back to the U S after multiple medal winner and he comes back to the U S and they still don't like want to treat him like he's one of the people, one of the guys kind of thing. And that just blows my mind. And, you know, you see it in you see it in a film like that. It's hard to know exactly, um, you know, what was really going on in his mind at the time and how was he able to literally under the Nazi flag run his heart out and still, you know, be the best in the world. And that, that was just really something. One thing I really like about the, the Jesse Owens story and for people that they can go and kind of look some of this up, but Luz Long, who was the main German competitor who was supposed to be the guy to take down Owens, that was their big dog. But and it's the friendship that they formed and how they supported each other out there and uh, just even thinking, you know, crazy things today with just current race relations and all that. But that's a pretty cool thing. I mean, you're in a hotbed of 
hatred at that moment and you're like hey we're just two guys trying to see who can jump the farthest that's what we want to do and you want you want that guy to achieve you know good things too and uh so that's a that's a pretty cool thing in in that whole story as well that's something well before we get too far away from the marathon i do think we gotta talk about elliot kipchoge i don't want to talk about the sub two hour event while that is a feat of a feat (laughs) what else can you say um I, I do think it's it's important to reflect on how he's been able to, in some ways, rewrite the map in marathoning, despite, or I guess, aside from those two-hour effort things that he's done. Um, so just a couple of things here really quickly on Kipchoge. Well, before he ever thought about or dreamed about the marathon, or I don't know if he was dreaming about it at the time, but... Uh, prior to his marathoning experiences, he was, he was a track star and you know, it's one of these things. So I want to talk about a couple of other track stars here that he raced against. But before I get to them in the 2003 world championships, Kipchoge was three months before his 19th birthday. So he's 18 years old running against legends like Hikam El Garouche, who is the world record mile holder, like Kenanisa Bekele, who up until just recently was the 5K world record holder. And so he's running against these legends, these epic distance runners, and he's 18 years old, and he takes them down in the World Championships 5K in a kick finish, you know, against <laughs> the speedsters of all speedsters. Um, and so like something like that, just, you know, that blows your mind. But then, so that was 2003. Now let's zoom forward to 2020. And 13 marathons later, he has only ever not won one marathon. He was second to a world record effort. So he just missed winning in world record time and has set world records in so many different ways with the marathon. And I just think, you know, when we reflect on on big moments and big people and careers and such, um, it's the hardest thing to do in running is to be the big one for a long period of time. You know, that, that's the hardest thing to do. And he's done it, and he's done it across multiple planes of running, and he's done it for such a period of time that um, it's just a really exciting thing to be able to live during that and see those things happening. Yeah, I think it's just impressive that, you know, talk about winning 2003 World Championships and then the fact that he's still, I mean, this is 17 years later, and the guy mm-hmm. is still on top of the world. Like most people do not have a professional 17-year career in athletics. It's way too hard. There's so many newcomers that will come in and out of the sport uh, that will eventually take you down and either you wear down or whatever. And he just continues to not only survive, but really just thrive. I mean, he's still pushing forward and, and really just almost inspiring another generation. And what I love about Kipchoge is I swear just mentally, he just seems, I don't know, on a different level, you know, of, of thinking. And I think that brings other people to like, stop putting barriers in front of you. Think, no, I'm, I can go do it. I can go do this. And that, it really starts to open eyes uh, to try those things. And, and he is phenomenal at just that singular focus and he can just execute so well. It, it's amazing to watch. I know you didn't want to talk about the sub two hour uh, marathon thing, but I have to say that it crossed the barrier of people who are just into running into the rest of the world knowing about it and rec- recognizing it as this huge feat of the human experience. So that was a really cool thing too, that he brought more people into the running world and kind of understanding what it takes. Um, well, maybe we don't understand what it takes, but being able to see someone perform at that level and be impressed and inspired by it. Yeah, you know, um, and just one more thing about Kipchoge. I remember, Q, this might've been four years ago now, so maybe around 2016, we were talking about Kipchoge once, and you just said to me, you're like, this is a guy who has figured out the marathon. He's, he's got it. And he does. And he's proven it in so many ways that that's, it's true. Yeah. So Q, what else you got for us? Uh, well, we could, we could stick with, uh, the marathon a little bit. This is a kind of older one kind of deals with, uh, Africans as well. And I just think it's a general cool story. I don't know tons and tons about the races, but, uh, a baby Bakila, uh, won the Olympic marathon twice. I think it was 64 and 68 uh, 1960 and, summer olympics and uh but he was also really big the big thing with him was that he ran barefoot which is just in general crazy to think you know barefoot running has has its phases but when people talk about barefoot running they don't talk about on the road running a marathon that's just not typically what they're referring to so one in general that's 
impressive and amazing. Um, the fact that he did that to win two Olympic marathons is absolutely impressive to, to be able to come back and defend that is super hard. There's so many factors that go into that. Uh, but the, to me, the neat part of the story kind of going on and even talking about passing it to another generation is in his third Olympics, uh, he was racing the marathon. Uh, which he was actually wearing shoes in that one. Uh, <laughs> maybe his feet got beat up enough. But <laughs> um, he was also in the Kenyan army, and another one of the uh, Kenyan team members was also in the Kenyan army. And uh, so at some point during the race, he realizes this isn't my day. I'm not going to win this race. I'm not going to defend my title. I'm not going to win for Kenya. And that's a huge thing in, in Kenyan distance running, to win for Kenya. Um, and so he goes over to Mama Woldy, who was a, a younger guy at the time and in mid race. And he looks at him and they, like I said, they were both in the army together and I don't know his exact rank, but he goes over and says something to the, the point of like, Lieutenant Woldy, I will not be able to win this race today. You must go win it for me. And Mama Woldy goes and wins the race. And that is like astounding to me. I mean, it, it's not like somebody can just look at me in a race and go, Nate, you need to go win this race. And I go, oh, okay. And, you know, like I don't just have that ability. Um, and obviously he was good, but uh, to go and do it and kind of what you were doing it for, it almost puts that more behind it. You know, when you get into those hard points in a race and you're like, why am I doing this? Why do I want to take one more step? And it's just like, for him, I have to. I have to, you know, I'm doing this. It's not, I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for someone else. And I think that's so cool. And in a sense, Bakili, Bakila was passing it on to Woldy, like another generation to pass it down the line. And you look at all the great Kenyan marathoners we've had since then. And it's kind of has formed that chain, which is cool. So I'm going to make this personal just for a second, because when I hear you say that about like, let's do this for, for the team, for Kenya, I feel like that's something that you do super well with team cultures, because like as, as, as a whim, woman on the team, so when you, you were my direct coach, but I was obviously able to, you know, see the men's team and how they interacted. And it was always for the team. Like guys are going out there and they putting themselves in the line. And there is something phenomenal that happens when you're like, I am doing this for us. It's more than just for me. I can suffer more if I'm suffering for us. And so I think that's kind of a, a cool thing that we're able to see in history. And then I can see today when I see, you know, your the teams that you cultivate. Yeah. You know, that, uh, that makes me think about a picture and in Q, I think you'll know what picture I'm talking about. It was 2006 cross country, I think regionals. And just after the race, a bunch of us were just standing around a picnic table and, you know, like one, one of the guys is sitting, I don't know, it's like Wes is sitting on the picnic table just with his, you know, his head in his hands and Derek's off to the side, just like staring off, like, um, you know, you can't, can't even imagine whatever the emotion is. Um, I think a couple of the guys were hugging, like there was just, it was just like a moment was captured there that I think really represented that well. I'm going to find this picture and I'm going to put it in the blog <laughs> post associated with this. That's Perfect. a to z running.com slash episode 46. So Andy, what else you got for us? Are we going to stay with distance running? I mean, we are like, of course, because that's the only running that counts. <laughs> hey, watch it. Watch it. Uh, I did want to mention Ted Corbett because he's considered the father of modern day distance running. And I thought his story was really interesting. And then until this year, until I started to do more of a search about running history, I didn't even know about him. But he was the one who won the very first U.S. national marathon. And he also was the one to make more accurate um, measuring of courses. So he's used a wheel, essentially, which is, you know, what we did. Do they still do that today? Like, how do they measure courses today? I is it still a wheel? <laughs> <laughs> I know that could be like the more old school way. But I mean, I trust a wheel over GPS any day because GPS can be fluky. But he did that. And then he also was like, as far as the ultra distance stuff, he competed in... Um, he ran up to 200 miles a week and he did lots of ultra races and he kind of got that culture started to do this really long distance stuff. I think I, uh, I think I got a little bit of that from you Q one time, a couple of years after graduating, I was at the YMCA, the snow globe, as we like to call it <laughs> downtown Grand Rapids and measuring their indoor track with a wheel. And now I've done it several times. I know what the distance is, but prior to a workout, I just felt like I just needed to double check, make sure exactly where to put the cone. And so I'd go out there with the wheel and measure it. And the looks I got and people just like wondering, what is this guy doing with this wheel on a cane? But it was worth it. I've been at national several times, just measuring certain things. Not that I thought the track was off, but especially like Johnson City Indoor, which was odd, like a 280 distance, kind of weird. But just certain things I wanted to know the specifics for sure. And I don't know how many times I had coaches going, 
uh, is the track correct? I'm like, yeah, I mean, the track's correct. That's not what I'm thinking. There's just certain things I really want to know. Right, like where splits are yeah. on this oddly shaped yes. track. Yeah. <laughs> then your answer to them is, don't you want to know? <laughs> So I got, uh, I got one here to take us uh, a little bit closer to the track then. So not that we're, not that we're going to depart from distance running entirely here, but uh, I, d- I did want to mention, I was talking about Kipchoge earlier and that epic 2003 national championship win. Um, well, he won over El Garouche. So we certainly have to talk about LG, as we like to call him, as everyone in the running community likes to call him. Um, the world record holder currently still in the mile and 1,500. And he has a, a career of just incredible proportions. So you, you look at like, I, I love those kinds of stats where it's like how many sub four miles, and how, you know, all these kinds of things and such. And, um, you know, one of the things that just seemed to set LG apart is that he, he could outrun just about anyone. So it's like his raw leg speed. So he'd run all these other races, all these other distances. And if, if we got down to the end into the final kick, it was always just like, yeah, LG's going to win it. Um, except for those rare instances when he did <laughs> rare instances. So talking about LG, one race that that we always have to bring up is the 2000 1500 Olympics, 1500 championship final. Um, and so LG versus Bernard Leggett versus Noah Nageni. And um, the three of them had gone head to head to head and head to head in v- multiple ways a number of times. And it was almost always LG. Um, every once in a while, Noah Nageni would, would take a win there. But uh, it was it was the world record attempt when LG ran the world record. Noah Nageni was right behind him. Everyone wondering if he was going to steal it from him right at the end there. And so the second fastest ever mile right there. So these three and Bernard Leggett has the second fastest 1500. So like these these are legends. And I should say this was Bernard Leggett prior to USA. This was still yep. Kenya. So they you know they go off in the race and of course it didn't take too long before it was clear that the three of them were going to be running that race against each other and it comes down to the final kick the last 100 the last 50 and they're all still in it together and you just you, you got to watch this race watch their legs moving and it's just like incredible to see these these guys going and Noah Nageni took the win <laughs> over LG and so I know I started this by saying I was going to talk about LG but um you know I think one of the things that's just so so incredible when when I think about track and field is um, the battles, the battles that happen. You know, there's there's these epic moments, and we're really actually uh, we're anticipating a potential another battle with the London Marathon um, as that unfolds. However, that uh, you know is going to manifest here with Bekele and Kipchoge running together against each other in the marathon. So um, these epic battles, you know, I really can enjoy and appreciate even going back and just rewatching these kinds of races and just wondering like what's going on in these guys' minds. They've raced each other so many times. They know what to expect. You know, they know that they've got to put everything on the line. And that's really cool. Yeah. I love, you got to love any situation where you can put basically like, even if it's just two, but when you start getting like three, almost like juggernauts of the sport and they're all in the same race and they all want to win it. And everyone thinks, man, it's probably this guy or maybe this guy. Everyone's got a certain little skill maybe the other one doesn't have or it's a little better. And But it just makes the race so good. You, and you never know. And it could be it early on. It could be boring and tactical because everyone wants to just save it. But still, the end is going to be insanity. And you just never know. When you talk about that last 50 meters and it's like, who is going to win this? Um, yeah, that that is some exciting track and field. And because at that point... I mean, you're just giving it everything. You don't want to lose. I mean, if you got the shot to win, you want to win. <laughs> and so that's, that's a big, big deal for sure. Yeah. So that's, you know, I, I say this every once in a while, but I think that's one of the things that makes me still want to train, still want to be competitive is for a moment like that. You know, I, 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 I can't say I've had very many of them in things like the marathon and such. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a lot of it's just me just trying to relive the, the track days in, in some ways. But that's, you know, that's what makes the sport exciting is that there, there is a battle. You don't feel that kind of urgency most of the race for even for most distances, even something like a mile. You don't feel that kind of urgency until you get to that end point. So the first and most important thing is you've got to be there at that end point. Yeah. And I just I, I love that that sensation. It's really something. So Q, give us another one. Um, I think if we just kind of switch back to, to marathoning real quick, I, I think a huge, another big one in our sport, we you know we talked about Dina earlier, but even before her, really the, the predecessor of all of it for American running is Joan Benoit or Joan Benoit Samuelson now, as she's known, but, uh, you know, she wins 
the 84 trials. She wins the 84 Olympics, which was the first Olympics marathon. It's also in the U.S. She's American. So that's a huge thing. But uh, just some of, the, some of the cool background things. Obviously, she had done a ton of things throughout her career, tons of American records from distance all the way from 3,000 and up. Um, and she still actually still runs today. She, I know even just in the recent years, she was trying to run the fastest marathon for a 60 year old woman. Yep. And, uh, she ran like three Oh three, you know, I mean, it's just like, wow, that's really good. You know, I like, gotta, I can't go do that. And, um, but, uh, just looking at some of her career and for the trials, she went in the trials, she was having some, some knee issues. So 15 days before the Olympic trials, she goes under arthroscopic knee surgery, which I look, when I read that, I go, well, then you can't run. Like someone days. went in and fixed your knee. You're not going to run in 15 days. You're not going to run a marathon. <laughs> and she goes, she wins the trials and it wasn't super fast. It was like 245 for the win in the trials. Um, well, she won the trials, got the chance to go to the USA and, she goes to the Olympics, which is, you know, on home soil, which is always cool. Always cool. I don't care what country you're from. If it's on your home soil and you're one of the big dogs in the race, that's a big moment. Um, and she at three miles and she's in there with Catherine Switzer. Uh, there's two uh, Ingrid Christensen. Uh, and I think Rosa Mata, who was another big name in there. Um, and so they're all really good runners. And at three miles, she, she starts to pull away from everyone and everyone lets her go. And as I read more and more into it, it was just uh, people were like, they didn't think that she was fit enough and that, that she would hold out. They just thought she would flame out. So they let her go. And she never came back. <laughs> never came back. Big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Big mistake. And so just so crazy to think, you know, that she enters a stadium and it's, you know, it's the L.A. Coliseum at the time. And just, you know, it must be thousands upon thousands of fans. It's a USA and um, just going crazy and just such a pioneer of the sport for for all women, um, I don't know. That just, it just that had to be an amazing, absolutely amazing moment for sure. I just think about how mentally tough she needed to be because there's so many times I would think for anybody that you can come up with an excuse, and she had legitimate excuses. So to be able to overcome that and still get after it, I think is really quite admirable. Because, I mean, even for me, it's like, oh, but this is kind of hurting me. So I'm giving myself a pass. Like, she didn't do that. She no. went and, you know, killed it. She crushed it. So the kind of mental strength that she must have had is is pretty great. And even to think, like, you know, whatever was she was feeling at the time, maybe the knee was totally fine and she knew it. but Or maybe there was still some lingering questions. But when you're in a major marathon, or honestly, any, really any marathon, but to break away at mile three is a bold choice. You know, most people that break away at mile three, you go, I will see you later. You know, I, we're going to come get you later. We're not worried. Um, and, uh, but she went and, and that's a bold move to make. And she did it and, and, and paid for it. And you talk about a little bit too, just about mental fortitude, but, and I'm sure she had a coach and the things were evolved, but you know, to go in and say like, Hey, we're gonna have the surgery. You gotta trust me. You can come back from this in two weeks and you'll be fine. And, you know, like there's a lot of trust that goes into that. And it's, uh, yeah, for sure. There had to be some challenges there. So talking about bold, I think Andy, you should probably touch on Usain Bolt briefly. If you don't know who Usain Bolt is, oh wait, you all know who Usain <laughs> Bolt is. <laughs> you can't miss them. But I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Cause there's a reason that he's super famous, right? I mean, the fact that he's was the fastest man alive and has world records and has broken his own, own world records is quite phenomenal. And I do want to just really quickly say, so I, I, I was in Jamaica right after kind of his, his biggest of big moments somewhere around that time period. So I, I was in Jamaica for the, the cross country race. Um, and you know, fly in and in the airport immediately, like you can't even get off the plane and his face was on everything, <laughs> everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, um, you know, if, if a sprinter in the USA were of that caliber, we would know who he is, but man, he was like, he is the celebrity. It was <laughs> so cool. Everyone talks about the triple in Rio, but really the triple that I think was the most impressive and what kind of, you know, put him on on the stage this world stage was the beijing beijing olympics where he set the world record in the 100 the 200 and the 4 by 100 all of those were world <laughs> records and he didn't do that in rio obviously he's he bettered all of those world records again but the fact that in one olympics he set three world records is mind-blowing if, if you want to like see some confidence we were just talking <laughs> about confidence i'm gonna link to the youtube with those videos because it is insane to watch him break away in such a short race. Like he wasn't just like leaning people out. 
he's like letting up before he he goes over the line. It's amazing. So in in talking about enjoying watching track and field, because I think everybody at this table likes to watch track and field, regardless of the specific nature of what we're watching in that given moment. But Q, why do you think people found it so much more entertaining and enjoyable to watch Usain Bolt? I think Usain Bolt, he just defied a lot of things that people, I think, at the time considered the norm. One, I think people always saw it kind of shorter, stocky sprinters, just that beefy, beefy guy, shorter strides. So they're just boom, quick, quick, quick. And you say Bolt's like probably the tallest guy out there. And so he did not fit the norm. And then he starts breaking these barriers. We're like, wait, well, maybe we need to get all tall sprinters, you know? And so that's kind of cool. The fact that he went in with the weight of the world on his shoulders. When you win the first ones, now he'd already done some big things, but, um, but to, to keep defending them, it's not easy. You know, everyone, you are the target and that is challenging. And the fact that he could just show up and have fun. I mean, he was always having fun to me as a coach. I almost go, that seemed like too much fun, like focus a little more, but Hey, for him, it worked. He just wanted to be calm and go out and do his thing. And, um, and he had fun. And that's what I think people who were maybe, uh, on the fringe of running or or stuff like that, that that they really loved about that. It wasn't like the guy just ran really fast, got done, went to the media and did an interview. He went out there, he had fun. He's playing with the mascots. He's doing Mm -hmm. his poses, you know, Mm -hmm. he's just running around. He's enjoying the sport. Um, and that's, that's really cool, especially because you look at a guy running the 100. You, it's not like when we go out and run long distances, we're enjoying what we're doing. And he's just like, boom, done. We go, oh, geez, did you even run very long? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I don't know. I, I think he changed the sport in that way. Another example of it, I actually got to see Usain Bolt's first world record in New York. I was actually at the race. Um, I was with my wife. We were at Randall's Island and you know, he breaks the hundred world record and most of the crowd was Jamaican. Um, and it was madness, pure <laughs> madness. And it, but it was exhilarating. I it, just, even being there, it was just so much fun. And somehow he created that atmosphere that was just fun. And I, I think that's a part of the sport. That's really important too. Yeah. He loved it. He loves beating people. Yeah. I've noticed that <laughs> he really does. And I have to say, we talked about Justin Gatlin on this podcast before. It just makes it even more remarkable when we tell you that Justin Gatlin has beat Usain Bolt. Like it's a big deal. And Justin Gatlin has been in the sport a really long time too. Yeah. So you just be looking out for him. Cause he does plan to try to qualify and go to the Olympics. Sure. Um, Usain Bolt is retired. Um, and he, I don't think he's coming out of retirement, even though there has been rumors, but I think he's going to stay in retirement. I liked his comment where he's like, well, if my coach tells me that I got to come out of retirement. I'm coming out. <laughs> so we're short on time, but we've got a couple of other really important names to mention. So maybe we do like kind of like an abbreviated lightning round here where just what are a couple of other things and what, what the accomplishment was. And we'll just kind of do a quick circuit. So Q, what are one or two others you got? Uh, I, do, I guess the one I'd throw out is just uh, Haile Gerbil Selassie, a huge mogul of the sport. And then Poulter got, one was Ethiopian, one was Kenyan. And they went head-to-head on the track tons of times. They both switched over the roads. Both had amazing careers, long careers. But they're head-to-head battles. Um, and one, it's just Kenya versus Ethiopia, which is two distance powerhouses. So you are the figureheads of your countries, record holders of your country. And um, to me, I think that rivalry uh, if you go back in the old days of like world cross country, I mean, it was like a Kenya, Ethiopia death battle and it was just, just crazy. And it's like, they would do anything to beat the other people. And, uh, and those guys continued to fuel that fire in a positive way. I don't think it was a negative thing, but, um, just amazing to see those certain figureheads. And then, like I said, they switched from the track to the road, still had great success and still push, push the sport farther, breaking world records and doing things that other people had never done before. If you want to see some of that, I'm going to try to find some links, some YouTube links. So I'll put that in the blog post too. Andy, what's your one or two other? I got to talk about Allison Felix. I'm a huge fan of Allison Felix. And not just because she's won the most amount of world and Olympic medals combined. You say that every time you say her name. <laughs> she literally just in conversation at home. Allison Felix, you know, the one who's won most of the world. <laughs> <laughs> she's also won nine Olympic medals, which is so many medals. I do want to talk about her race in London for the 2012 London Olympics against Shelly, Shelly Ann Fisher Price, Carmelita Jeter, Veronica Campbell Brown, Sunny Ridges Ross, like the powerhouses, the like the best sprinters that ever lived were in this race. And uh, she ended up winning it and she had won silver the previous two Olympics and it was 
her first gold in the 100 meter. And it was just really amazing to see her break through those barriers and beat a uh, world record holder and uh, the reigning Olympic champion. So anyway, that is a great race to watch. I'm going to link to that one too. So inspiring. And I am still really curious if she's ever tried to go through TSA security with all her medals on at once. <laughs> and if not, Allison Felix, please try to do that sometime and let us know what happens. I got to say, too, and say, Allison Felix is one of the nicest people in track and field. She is seriously, she is, I mean, she's got a huge amount of accomplishments, but she's not like, she could just talk to you on the street. And she's just that nice and considerate and understands the sport. And she knows that she's a pioneer of what she did and that she's helping the next generation move too, even though she's not done yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but just, I love watching that kind of stuff. And I'm going to link to a photo that I have with her because <laughs> I'm very proud of it. <laughs> Andy's so excited that she met Allison Felix. But she wasn't wearing all of her medals. I think she's wearing one or two. <laughs> I think she's only allowed to wear a couple. So the last thing that I'm going to mention, and there's actually a reason why I'm mentioning this and mentioning it last, is um, I want to talk just very briefly about Arthur Lydiard. And part of the reason why, as you all know, um, if you've listened to the last couple episodes, is I have the opportunity to reach out to uh, one of Lydiard's last living original Olympic medalists. So Barry McGee, who lives in New Zealand, is um, he's, he's sharing with me his training insights and part of my quest to understand what was Lydiard really truly doing. And a large part of the reason why I'm on that quest is because of what was happening with his athletes at the time. And so in the 1960s, you look at like the 60 and 64 Olympics, he was basically running medalists. Anytime he got an athlete to the Olympics, they were meddling and like things like that were going crazy. You have Peter Snell and some of the other guys. Um, but then also, and Q, I want you to say this because just right before we started recording, you mentioned a story about when Lydiard went to Finland because he was going to, they were asking him to be the coach over there for a time as well. So he was on a, a tour of Finland when they're bringing him over to be their nationals coach. And uh, they were just touring around and they were at some sort of factory or something like that. And he was very confident that he could turn anyone into a champion under his training system. And uh, I think somebody maybe said, like, well, what about this guy? Like, he was like a security guard at the plant. And he goes, okay. And a year later, that guy wins the Finnish national championship in the 800, running 147 back in the mid-60s, uh, which is a phenomenal time back then. And that's, that's mind-bending for me. I've coached for a long time. And I don't think I could, I think I have good training methods. I think I've gotten people to do really well. I don't know if one year I could take a guy off the street and make him the champion. I, that's just well beyond what I can think, but, but he did it. And that that's just astonishing to me. And so we all know, and this, this is might be just kind of a summary statement here as we're kind of closing out this topic. Um, you know, we all know that in running, the most important thing you know, when we talk about running and training and such is just showing up every day and being consistent. You know, it, if, if you have a quality training plan and you can execute it well over time, you're going to see improvement. You're going to be able to get closer to your goals um, if, you can, if you can be consistent. Uh, but the, you know, there's, there's probably not any kind of real true magic sauce to like, you know, what makes it happen and can do so for anyone, anytime. But it's clear that, you know, some, some figures over time, like Lydiard definitely wrote the map that we use today for how we train athletes. We don't train them all exactly the way he did then. Um, there's certainly been variations of over the years, but, uh, you know, it's important as we just kind of reflect on these big moments and these big histories, you know, from coaches to sprinters to marathoners and, and everything that's going on in distance running. Um, it's, it's exciting to know the sport in, in that way as well. And I think, you know, I said it earlier, but Q, one of the things I most appreciated when I was first getting to know you as a coach was the passion for the sport. And not just that it was like a passion for doing the sport, but a passion for knowing the sport. And I hadn't seen that before that. And honestly, I don't encounter it very often, even in other passionate runners. And so, you know, we want to try to share that a little bit with our audience here and, and really just encourage that exploration of the sport and the history and the athletes and, and even the memorabilia. And if you don't know what some of this stuff looks like, Q's got a museum. It's awesome. I'm going to take a few pictures. So we'll be linking to that too. <laughs> So Q, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for sharing your insights and the conversation. There's so much more that we could share. So I feel like there's got to be a part two to this episode sure, coming up. For sure. Appreciate your time. Thank you. So we told you in the beginning of this conversation that he was a collector. And I actually posted a couple pictures of his collection and I could not get it even near to its entirety because I didn't have like a panoramic view of the room. But people actually pay to go to Q's basement and see his track and field collection. Do they really? 
Well, no, they but could, they should. Right? They should. But they should yes. because they pay to go to museums, and that's you. basically you that. what it is. Well, I got to go there, and that was really Did you cool. play the track and field game? I didn't. You no. didn't play the game? No, I just oh. took a couple pictures. Classic but track and field arcade. 250 here. frames. I just wanted to give you that stat. 250 frames. Yes, which is incredible. And he said that he's only missing one one issue, issue of track and field news the, and it happens to be the first the very one. first one oh. yeah so i wanted to mention that and we also talked about usain bolt and how he's tall and i just want to let you all know he's six five. Oh, he's not that tall i thought you i thought you were gonna say he's tall but he's, i'm kidding i just wanted to give I'm you kidding. a stat you know i'm joking That's, we love facts huge. here yeah look at him on any finish line when the other well it, it helps that he's always like you know 50 meters ahead of everyone else at the finish line but seriously though he's just enormous compared to these other sprinters it's it's really just an incredible thing when you see it. So there was so much more that we could have discussed. And when I went to his basement, I saw all of those photos of track and field athletes throughout history that were featured on the cover of Track and Field magazine. I just I just wanted to let you all know that there's so much more that we could have talked about. And we hope you enjoyed this episode. If you loved it, let us know because we could have him on and we could talk about this uh, this topic again with different stories for you. Yeah, you can't honestly think that in one 30-minute conversation, <laughs> we covered all of the most notable moments in track and field and running history. Not a chance. Not a chance. So just remember to head to adzrunning.com, jump up to the corner and click follow and join the conversation on social media, send some comments, give us some questions, and we're going to share your stuff on the podcast.